Welcome to the Chicago Humanities Festival and today's program, Rabbi Laura Jonathan Sachs on morality. My name is David Chayavitz, and I'm a professor of history at Northwestern University and the director of Northwestern's Crown Family Center for Jewish and Israel Studies. The Crown Family Center is an academic hub for undergraduate and graduate education, faculty and student research, and accessible and engaging public programming. Our students, faculty members, and visiting scholars study, teach, and research Jewish history, Jewish philosophy and thought, Hebrew and Yiddish language and literature, Holocaust studies, and the history, politics, and culture of the state of Israel. A core part of the center's mission is connecting our university community with the broader public community. And so we're very proud to be serving as a presenting partner for this program. You can learn more about the Crown Family Center and our ongoing programming by visiting www.jewish-studies.northwestern.edu. This week's programs with the Chicago Humanities Festival are presented with the support of the Robert R. McCormick Foundation. You can learn more about upcoming conversations and help support these free events by going to chicagohumanities.org. Now, it's my honor to introduce today's moderator, law professor and author Amy Chua, and of course, our presenter, Rabbi Lord Jonathan Sachs. Rabbi Lord Sachs is an international religious leader, philosopher, award-winning author, and respected moral voice, who's been described by His Royal Highness the Prince of Wales as a light unto this nation, and by former British Prime Minister Tony Blair as an intellectual giant. He served as the Chief Rabbi of the United Kingdom and the Commonwealth of Nations from 1991 to 2013, was knighted in 2005, and took his seat in the House of Lords in 2009. Rabbi Lord Sachs is the recipient of countless honors, including the 2016 Templeton Prize, which was awarded in recognition of his exceptional contributions to affirming life's spiritual dimension. He holds degrees from Oxford and Cambridge universities, is the recipient of 18 honorary degrees, and is the author of over 30 books, including most recently, Morality, Restoring the Common Good in Divided Times, which was a bestseller in the UK and has just appeared in print here in the United States. Amy Chua is the John M. Duff Jr. Professor of Law at Yale Law School. She graduated from Harvard College and Harvard Law School, where she was executive editor of the Harvard Law Review. After practicing on Wall Street, she joined the Yale Law School faculty in 2009 and is a noted expert in the areas of foreign policy, globalization, and ethnic conflict. Professor Chua is the best-selling author of numerous award-winning books, including World on Fire, How Exporting Free Market Democracy Breeds Ethnic Hatred and Global Instability, appeared in 2002, Day of Empire, How Hyperpowers Rise to Global Dominance and Why They Fall, appeared in 2007, and The Triple Package, How Three Unlikely Traits Explain the Rise and Fall of Cultural Groups in America, from 2013. Her 2011 memoir, Battle Hymn of the Tiger Mother, was a runaway international bestseller, and has been translated into 30 languages. Her latest book is Political Tribes, Group Instinct, and the Fate of Nations. Without any further ado, uh, it's a pleasure to welcome Professor Amy Chua and Rabbi Lord Jonathan Sachs. Thank you so much, David, for that great introduction. And hello, Rabbi Lord Sachs. Mm -hmm. It is so wonderful to meet you um, semi in person. Uh, mm -hmm. I am a huge admirer of your work and you, and I'm so excited and honored to have this opportunity to chat with you about your truly incredible book. I, I could not put it down. Um, it's a tour de force. It's brilliant and eye-opening and funny, Rabbi, it's funny. Um, and of course, just truly visionary, which I think makes it perfect for um, the theme of this year's um, Chicago Humanities Festival which really is about reimagining a new world, a new reality. And I think we all desperately feel we need to do that in this time of toxic politics and alienation and, and actual trauma. I feel like my students are walking around in trauma. So with that um, welcome, I wanna start Rabbi with your first chapter, which is on loneliness. Um, I thought it was fascinating the way that you actually document the ship empirically starting in the mid 1960s from a kind of what you call a we culture to really an I culture, me, I mean I. Um, and then you show how this is related to what you call the loneliness epidemic that we're experiencing in the UK, the US and also outside the West, which I also thought was interesting. Um, and I got to tell you, I see this so strikingly in my students. You're absolutely right. It's different. But my students are, it's, it, well, you offer statistics. I think you say 46% of Americans always or sometimes feel alone. 
So I wonder if you could talk a little bit about this, where you think we went wrong, how we can start to rebuild a sense of community and including the role that religion uh, and particularly Judaism has played in the past and perhaps should play again. thing is that something happened in the 1960s, which I understand all too well, because I was there when it happened, in the room when, when, it, when it happened, um, because somehow or other a generation arose, which said, we are going to do things differently. We are going uh, not to be bound by anyone else's standards except our own. They were following the existentialists. They were following the, the, that, that kind of tradition on the continent. But something happened that was unique, which is in the 1960s, the older generation suddenly lost confidence and didn't tell young people that they were making a mistake. And they lost confidence because they said to themselves, look, we brought about two world wars. We are no role models for anyone. Let them do their thing and they will do better than we did. And of course, you know, if you remember being there, it was just an extraordinary thing because you had people like the Beatles going to meditate in India John Lennon and George Harrison taking LSD the whole time, and they were in their inner world. It was a world of I, but it was supposed to be the universe. And uh, suddenly, all of a sudden, this idea that there are certain normative structures in society suddenly disappeared. I mean, for instance, Elaine and I, just at the height of the lockdown, celebrated our golden wedding this summer. So, you know, I mean, you understand, we were quite young. I mean, she was 21, I was 22. We took it for granted. That's what happened. You are going to make a life, you get married, and you raise children, and you create the structures of we, the marriage, the family, the community, and all of that. And somehow or other, a whole generation said, I don't need anyone else for my happiness. I uh, follow your own bliss as Timothy Leary of Harvard used to put it. And uh, things kind of spun on from there because in the 1980s, people said the same thing about economics, you know, Thatcherism, Reaganomics, uh, let's deregulate everything. Let self-interest generate economic growth. And I'm not critical of that. It did generate economic growth, but it also degenerated the sense of responsibility of owners of businesses to employees of businesses and so on. So one way or another, they had, there was this extraordinary moment when the West lost its self-confidence after two world wars and let the young people carry on with their blessing and said, look, we trust you to find something better. Uh, I suppose that reached a height in the States in Woodstock, you know, um, we've got to get, ourselves back to the garden, that kind of stuff. And, um, you know, at the end of the day, uh, the bill is a long time coming. But when the bill comes, it's quite a, an expensive bill in terms of broken marriages, in terms of uh, fatherless children, in terms of completely atrophied communities, in terms of people who are just plain on their own. That is one of the reasons for the opioid crisis in the States. It's one of the reasons for depression. We are now picking this up with teenagers. You know, um, teenage suicides suddenly went through the roof in 2013 and have stayed there ever since, largely because they are not meeting face to face anymore. They're only meeting uh, through the electronic screen. So, you know, it was done as always with the best of intentions, but it was subject to the law of unintended consequences. Wonderful. So um, 
I want to come back to the role of social media. You know, in my own work, I get asked about this all the time. But, but before that, you know, Rabbi, one of my favorite chapters in the book, I thought it was so insightful. You talk about the rise of a self-help mentality and its limits. And again, I think you are so spot on. I mean, this is a huge industry um, and it's um, uh, viewed as very positive. So I thought it was very refreshing to kind of get your take on it. Like I was thinking about how many people I know, um, this very narcissistic, uh, they'll, they'll go work out in a gym. You know, they'll go work out for three hours and they will come back and feel completely virtuous. You know, uh, and I'm not knocking that either. I wish I could make myself do that. But I, I do think you you pick up something. I mean, these books about, you know, even the way we teach our students now, it's how you can help yourself. So if you could say a little bit more about that. And I was very struck by this line. Um, if you could explain what you mean when you say morality is precisely unself-help. I thought that was very interesting. Yeah. I don't know. It's still painful to me, the story I tell in that chapter. It happened on my honeymoon. Shall I tell the story? Please. That's what got me thinking about it. I had a similar experience, so that's why it jumped yeah. out at me. It was a crazy thing. Elena and I were uh, in a little Italian coastal town called Paston, lovely town with Roman ruins. It had a beautiful beach. It had a lovely sea. And it was a glorious day, and I wanted to go out into the sea. The only trouble is my parents actually never taught me how to swim. And I can't swim. But I could see people standing 400 feet out into the sea, and they were only up to their knees. So I said to Elaine, um, I'm going to paddle out 400 feet, and I'll only be up to my knees, and then I'll come back. So I paddled out 400 feet. I was only up to my knees. I turned around, I started walking back, and within 10 seconds, I found myself out of my depth. There was no way I could swim to save myself. There was no one near me. The swimmers were somewhere else. And I remember when I went under for the fifth time, thinking two thoughts, number one, what a way to begin a honeymoon. <laughs> and number two, what is the Italian for help? <laughs> well, somebody must have seen me um, because somebody saw me, picked me up, picked me up, dragged me on his shoulders, deposited me unconscious at Elaine's feet. I still don't know who it was. There's somebody out there without whom I wouldn't be alive. But I think to myself, that was the moment I discovered the limits of self-help. You know, self-help, when you really need help, it's when you are drowning and you lift your hand up and, and, and you wave and somebody takes hold of your hand and lifts you to safety. Or to use the other metaphor used by our Talmud, a prisoner cannot release himself from prison. You can't cure your own depression. Somebody else needs to release you from that prison. So what we have right now, right now, is an enormous number of people, certainly in Britain, I don't know whether it's true in America, who because of the lockdown, because they've been deprived of company, because they've hardly been out of their houses for months, they are in a state of acute depression. But many of them just don't have that other person who will recognize their cry for help and just come around and help them, you know, because it needs somebody else to say, you know, let's go for a walk, let's... Uh, Let's get the endorphins going. And um, I, I feel really sad for people because we've got so used to thinking that in the last analysis, we have to rely on ourselves. And actually in the last analysis, we really need to rely on someone else. Well, that's a perfect uh, jumping point. Let's talk about family. You know, reading your book, I kept thinking of all these parallels um, 
between Chinese immigrant families and Jewish immigrant families. Um, so you have an incredibly powerful chapter about family and how that is being threatened. And thank you, Rabbi, uh, for the funny shout out. Um, in your book, uh, you write, Amy Chua's Battle Hymn of the Tiger Mother made many of us realize that Jewish mothers are signally outdone by their Chinese counterparts. Um, true, you know what? And I, true. I don't think it's actually true. You know what I think? I think it's more generational. Um, so what I mean is, if you think back to the way that Jewish immigrants behaved in this country, or perhaps the UK, in the 1920s and 1930s, when they were really fearful for survival, it's amazing. I've seen a lot of books about this. They wanted their kids to be doctors and physicists. They had to get straight A's. Education was the most important thing. You have to play the piano or violin. It's, it's, I think it's very, very similar. I don't think Jews are out dead. I just think that it's an immigrant pattern that once you get to the second generation, you take up a lot of pressure. Maybe you can be a poet, you know? So, so I, I thought that was very interesting, but more to your new uh, book, two lines in your book really struck me about family. The first is you wrote, the Jews became an intensely family oriented people. And it was this that saved us from tragedy. So I wanted to ask you whether you've seen this changing specifically among Jews, and is this feature at risk of being lost now? You know, you know, because in China, they're having the same problem. They're all this filial piety. And in China, they're trying to legislate it. Like, you must have filial piety or else we're going to throw you in jail. <laughs> um, and the second line was, um, relatedly, you wrote, uh, for a whole variety of reasons, almost everything that marriage once brought together has now been split apart. So if you could elaborate on those two, um, especially because of our co-sponsors, I was very interested because I think a lot about Chinese families, Chinese immigrant families, and you know, you know, the parallels in, in, in the Jewish community. <laughs> I think Jews and Chinese are very, very similar. In the following things, number one, they love the family. Number two, they are passionate about education. Number three, they have a high regard for tradition. Number four, they take business and wealth creation very, very seriously. So I think all of those things bring us together. I, I first really discovered this, actually, I don't know if it makes sense to you. Um, when I was chief rabbi, I was chief rabbi of the Commonwealth. And that meant I was chief rabbi of Hong Kong. Ah. So I was there in 97 when the British handed it back to the Chinese and Chris Patton, the last governor of Hong Kong, handed over to the first Beijing appointee, Mr. Tung Chi Wa. Tung Chi Wa, I sat with and he discussed this passion for the family that links us. And then he said, Rabbi Sachs, I want to ask you something. Your people and my people have been around for a very long time. We've been around 5,000 years. Your people have been around, I think, 6,000 years. I want to know, what did you do for the first 1,000 years before you had kosher Chinese takeaways? And I said, Mr. Tung, you know what we did for the first 1,000 years? We complained about the food. <laughs> so <laughs> we had a big laugh about that. Um, <clears throat> I think Judaism is built around the family, our key ritual. Above all, Friday evening, the Sabbath, Pesach, Passover. These are things that are celebrated around the family table. But a lot of people aren't doing that anymore, right? Oh, yeah, yeah, sure. No, I have to explain something, Amy. When I became chief rabbi in 1991, I, took, I suddenly, I realized, I'd been looking at this for a long time, that our community was becoming assimilated, less committed, less knowledgeable, less Jewish. And I said, well, if that's going to happen, then that's the end of anglo Jewry, And I can't let that happen. So for the first five years, I campaigned non-stop for what I call Jewish renewal, which was basically intensifying Jewish education. And when I became chief rabbi, we had 25% of Jewish children at Jewish day schools. And when I left, 
we had 70%. So we had the most educated, knowledgeable, and committed generation of young Jews ever in the entire 350 year history of Anglo Jewry. Whether that can be done in America, I don't know and I doubt. But we did it in Britain. We really did. And one of the things that happened was that, and it's still happening, is that Jewish children are going to Jewish day schools where their parents never went to Jewish day schools. Oh. So the five-year-old children know more than their parents. So we mediate this by the Friday evening meal where the child talks about the weekly Bible portion and makes a little speech to the parents. It's a wonderful, wonderful piece of role reversal because it momentarily turns the children into parents and the parents into children. It's stunningly beautiful. And we have found that within our synagogue communities, the family today in Anglo Jewry is as strong as ever. And um, Jewish marriages are more joyous than ever. I mean, you know, th th there's nothing old fashioned about them. Just, they're just exuberant. And so um, I think we have shown that you can stand against societal trends and do su so successfully. So Rabbi, you were making the fascinating point uh, that identity politics is really a mutation of multiculturalism. Um, if you could just say a little more, it's an absolutely fascinating idea. My, um, you know, the, the fundamental unit of my thought and it's basic to the book is the concept of covenant. That is a society is something where we all agree to work together for the good of all. Yes, of course, we're gonna compete, compete for power and for wealth, but over and above that, we are going to work for the welfare of all. And that makes out of massive number of subgroups, a single society. And that of course is what, for instance, made my parents, both of whom were immigrants, proud to be British. What did they say? We are proud Jews and we're proud English men and women. So being strong in your own local identity and your own national identity made sense. And of course, my parents knowing that knew that they had to help other groups in society who might be less well off. Um, identity politics, having put everyone into non-communicating ghettos, having got them as it were to be competing for self-righteousness and indeed for victimhood, actually, massively uh, multiplies the animosity between groups. And whoever says this is for the sake of justice or equality could not be more wrong because in the end, it will be seen that the real losers of any set of identity politics were the people who were losers to begin with. And, and we have to get people out of ghettos, feeling we belong in the mainstream. That is what Martin Luther King was so good at doing. And I do and, believe, yes, I believe with leaders like you, you know, I'm in a very small, uh, like a pebble compared to what you do, but I've noticed this on a college campus that it used to be what I loved is I would have conservative students and very liberal students. And in my classes, I would, you know, integrate, we would debate, and afterwards people would go out for coffee and there would be these cross political, cross religious um, conversations and then friendships would develop. Right now at Yale Law School, it's just almost impossible. So if you are a liberal now and you make friends with somebody who is a known conservative, you get shamed, you get called out and you're not really a member of the tribe. So, so what I do, I think I'm taking a page from you. I just, in my class, I say, look, in this class, we are going to talk as a community. You know, and if you hear somebody say something that offends you, please give them the benefit of the doubt that they are not necessarily a racist. Maybe they just didn't know the right words to use. And you know, mm -hmm. I've had really pretty thriving debate. Um, so I think if you have this vision um, and then leadership, um, 
people actually want to do it. Um, Rabbi, we have some amazing questions from the audience. Um, and I want to ask them uh, before our time is up. This is one from Nikki. And she uses a key uh, term in your book. She writes, living through a cultural climate change, which I love. I love that, uh, that term in your book. She says, living through a cultural climate change, how do we truly know truths and what is moral? Well, <laughs> truth, you know, you, 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 it, this is not rocket science. I'll tell you what used to happen. What used to happen in the Middle Ages, what used to happen in the great wars of religion after the Reformation, is you had Protestants and Catholics murdering one another across Europe. And that was when very wise people like Newton and like Descartes said, we can't spend our time fighting wars. We're interested in advancing knowledge. So let's see if we can build knowledge without basing it on doctrinal assumptions. And that's how science emerged in the 17th century. Science didn't emerge before the 17th century. It emerged because people wanted to be able to work together in pursuit of truth without being distracted endlessly by what religion they were or what color they were or what have you. So, and you will find that basically that form of truth is as available to us today as ever. It is simply something that you need to research, you need to chase the footnotes, you need to, to read the stuff. Uh, sometimes people just don't know. A lot of stuff about treatment for uh, COVID-19 is not yet at a state of truth. It's, you know, but what you do is you test, you test, you test. And that is one of the great achievements of Western civilization. And then let's not kid ourselves. Um, there are certain things that are not necessarily truth, but not everything. You know, uh, there's a well-known British atheist. Does, does this name mean anything to you, Richard Dawkins? Does that yes, name mean of something? Of course, of course. So Richard, Richard said to me once, or he said his daughter actually, never accept anything without the evidence. So I said, Richard, tell me, are you an optimist or a pessimist? I said, he said, obviously I'm an optimist. I said, Richard, show me the evidence. <laughs> you know, being an optimist or a pessimist cannot be resolved by the evidence because it determines how you interpret the evidence. But most serious things, um, are amenable to scientific truth, and we should never lose it. So let's not confuse some things that are matters of opinion with the 98% of things that are not matters of opinion. Um, and, and what was the other question? There was a- Oh, well, um, I have a, actually the, a, a question from another audience member, Todd Lending, feeds right into this. You were talking about the enlightenment and truth. His question, very interesting. Similar to the laws of physics, are there aspects of morality that would also be considered universal laws? Or is morality a more relative term that is defined and determined by the historical, cultural, and social norms of the day? Uh, let me ask you, Amy, what is the first moral judgment your daughters made? First moral judgment. That's I'll, I'll tell you, shall I tell you the first moral judgment any Israeli child aged four makes? Tell me. Zelo fair. It's not fair. <laughs> you know, that's probably universal. <laughs> yeah, indeed. Isn't Paul Bloom at Yale? Yes, yes. So Good read friend. his book, Just Babies. Yes, um, oh, yes, Paul, I, I know it. Yeah. So I think... Um, the short answer is that there are certain moral principles that are universal. The most obvious example is justice. Justice in the States is the same in Russia as in China as in anywhere. And it's the same through the centuries. There's certain other things like honesty, integrity, um, reciprocity. Um, those things are universal in the sense that we now know 
through uh, a branch of biology called evolutionary psychology, that those things are necessary to the formation and sustenance of any social group, human or even not human. So those things are absolutely universal. Other things are highly particular and specific to culture. So let me give you an example. Aristotle describes as, as one of his virtuous types, the megalopsuchos, the great souled man, you know, the, the aristocrat. Yes. The tall and, and <laughs> chilled and just effort. You, you know, there was an Edwardian writer, Saki, who said back in 1910, said to a friend, let's walk around for half an hour looking effortlessly superior. <laughs> so so the, the Megalopsuchos did that kind of thing. But you look at Moses, more humble than any man on earth, you cannot put humility into Aristotelian ethics. And you cannot put the Megalopsuchos into Jewish ethics. So it's a little bit like um, um, in language that there's something called a depth grammar that's common to all 6,000 languages. And then there are all these different things that make those 6,000 languages different from one another. So there are universals and there are particulars. And obviously when we're looking at a subject like this, how do we put society back together, our first emphasis has got to be on the universals. Amazing. Um, I have a third and final question from the audience and I'll return to my own. This is anonymous and this is a, I think this is an interesting one. Um, how do you support an organization that has legitimate grievances, but who demonstrate violently? Huh. I know. <laughs> you know, I, th I think there comes a time when you say to your friends, beloved, beloved friends, I'm with you, heart and soul. But um, when you commit yourself to violence, I'm not with you at all, and I am simply not going to join you. There was a... Um, I'm sorry, I'm going back to uh, the Jurassic age, but yeah. you remember, you, you know, the, 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 there was a um, double album of the Beatles in 1968 called the White Album. Yeah. And John Lennon has a song there called Revolution. Yes. And it's really, really worth, um, worth listening to. Because that is the question he's answering. And, um, you know, um, he's telling them that when they t talk violence, they can count him out. And when you talk Chairman Mao, you're not going to get anywhere, anyhow, et cetera, et cetera. It's a, it's a very, very bold statement because the Beatles in 67 were all you need is love. And suddenly in 68, you had the assassinations, Martin Luther King, Robert F. Kennedy, you have the, the demonstrations, you had Les Evénements in Paris. Uh, all of a sudden, that was the end of that dream of the 60s. And the White Album was the kind of Beatles response. And I, I thought the John Lennon thing was incredibly bold saying, you know, okay, I'm with you, but not if you're gonna advocate violence. Wonderful. Um, could, I, could I ask the question uh, to uh, search that one out on uh, on on YouTube or something? <laughs> it's great. Right. Song. Um, I want to go back um, to another common topic that we've both been very interested in. You had mentioned um, uh, very kindly my book World on Fire. You know that I've written about the dangers of democracy. Although sure. how we define democracy is, is is you know we could we could say it's not dangerous. Um, by defining democracy in a certain way. You have written so powerfully in this book about how our democracy today is in danger. 
I wonder if you could say a little bit more about that. I mean, it's, um, uh, you know, it's kind of all these themes, but it's, it's an important part of your, your, your thesis. There were these two th uh, civilizations in ancient times and the West is basically built out of them, built out of them and, and, and their interactions, ancient Greece and ancient Israel. Ancient Greece, was the, they were the world's masters in conceptualization. And they had names for everything. So all the names we have, democracy, oligarchy, tyranny, monarchy, and all the rest of them, all of those, are Greek words, um, and incidentally, be aware uh, that Plato in particular in the Republic believed that democracy was an unstable form yeah. of government. And uh, in the end, every democracy would collapse because the people would ask for a strong ruler who would impose his will on the nation and democracy would shade into tyranny. But that was the Greeks, and the Greeks were really interested in what is the structure by which you create governments. Judaism never had a name for any of this. It doesn't have words for these things. It borrowed the words from the Greeks. But one thing it did say loud and clear, Moses says it in Deuteronomy, and then the prophet said, Amos, Hosea, Isaiah and Jeremiah, what matters in a society is not the structures, but whether people within that society act honestly, act compassionately, whether they care about the widow, the orphan and the stranger, whether people exploit other people for economic gain. Are these um, societies where people feel respected, where they feel that they are honored as part of a society, even if they are not as rich as some other people in a society, open any page of Jeremiah or any page of Deuteronomy, and that's what you get. The prophetic understanding is that it is morality that dictates the success or failure of any free society, not the voting structure whereby you get a government. Now, Obviously, I'm part of that tradition, but it does seem to me that those prophetic voices coming to us from between 32 and 26 centuries ago are as incandescent today as they were then. And um, that's why I am convinced that having lost the moral basis of society, in the end, democracy, the formality of the thing, uh, will be challenged. Thank you. Um, since we just have a few minutes left, I want to go, um, you know, it was a funny quote you said about being um, an optimist. I am an optimist, but in these times, it's very hard to stay an optimist. Uh, you turn on the TV or look at social media, it's just a nightmare. So, you know, you, you have a last incredible chapter on the pandemic. Um, a, a COVID. <clears throat> and, you know, a lot of people thought that maybe this um, would bring people together that find, like after September 11th in the United States. Unfortunately, the opposite has happened in the United States. Um, the pandemic itself has become swallowed up by tribalism and polarization. You know, sometimes you, you were talking about truth and facts. Sometimes I have to flip between uh, cable news stations to try to figure out whether even a certain medication works, you know, it's so uh, bound up with, you know, getting rid of Donald Trump or this, it's actually very hard. So um, give us some hope, uh, Rabbi, how can we change? How can we collectively move to a new vision of the world? Um, what are the things that we should all do? And what are your recommendations? Look, the fact is that we can do it because we did it before. The example I give is after 1945. You know, people have been through hell. And the question was, would they go back to the way they were or would they do something completely different? And Britain and America decided to do something completely different. Britain uh, enacted the 1944 Education Act, which extended secondary education to everyone in Britain, 
nobody was not able to afford secondary education. Along uh, in 1945, along came the National Health Service, the most extraordinary we statement in all of British history. And with it came the foundations of the welfare state. So Britain became a we society, having been an I society before. America did something very similar through the GI Bill and a lot of the other legislation it undertook at that time. But it also did something else. One of the most far-sighted and frankly inspiring pieces of foreign policy in all of history, namely the Marshall Plan, whereby America, with the generosity of the victor, gave loans to every European country, including Germany, to rebuild their shattered economies. And the end result of those two movements was 75 years of peace. It was an extraordinary achievement, so it can be done because it was done. But let me end, if I may, Amy, by a really, really fundamental distinction, which is very important to me. People think that optimism and hope are the same thing or similar things. Actually, they're completely different things. Optimism is the belief that things are going to get better. Hope is the belief that if we work hard enough together, we can make things better. Optimism is a passive virtue. Hope is an active one. It needs no courage whatsoever, just a certain naivety. <laughs> to be an optimist, but sometimes it takes a great deal of courage to have hope. No That's Jew looking, looking back on history can be an optimist, but no Jew worthy of his or her soul ever lost hope. So forget the optimism, <laughs> but never forget the hope. I have learned something important today. And with that, I think it's a perfect way uh, to end this conversation. Rabbi, I could listen to you for hundreds of hours and I have a thousand more questions that we could talk about. But um, thank you for that fascinating uh, conversation. It's been such an honor. And I recommend everybody to read uh, uh, the rabbi's book. It's actually, it's a page turner actually. And again, it's very funny <laughs> in addition to being really profound and inspiring. So thank you, Rabbi. Thank you.